and uh, we wanted to look at his one big mistake. Praise God. Now, the, the elders in our meeting often talk about the need for uh, someone to proofread all the things that goes out into the public, you know, because sometimes people make mistakes. We misspell things, and uh, so, so there is a need sometimes to, to read it over again to make sure everything is right before it goes out into the public. Last week, after the, after the Sunday service, and um, our newsletter comes out on Wednesday or Thursday. So I often go to check on uh, the, the, the newsletter. And uh, how many of you do that? Very few people. Thank you. Two of you do that. Thank you so much. Uh, but you need to go in and see what is happening. Anyway, I, I went in there and, and uh, clicked on the sermon for the week. And when I saw the title of the sermon, I... I, I, you know, I said, well, we really need somebody to go over it again. You know what the sermon title said? The big mistake, Pastor Babu. <laughs> so that was very creative. And, and I, I'm sure if you went there and opened the open that uh, site, you will really want it to read what the big mistake is. <laughs> All right? So uh, we, we do want to thank our media newsletter team for their faithful work. <laughs> Praise God. But I know they didn't mean what, what it said. All right? <laughs> Praise God. Amen. I said, what am I doing here? Uh, you know, Uncle Oscar was very very afraid of flying in an airplane. And I don't know if any of you are very afraid of flying in an airplane, but some people are, and, and uh, he had to fly an airplane, so, so his friends comforted him and said, you'll be all right, you, you can fly, and uh, you will get there, and everything will be okay. But So he, very fearful, got into the plane and uh, makes that first ride in a plane flight in the plane. And, and when that all was over, he came back and his friends gathered around him and said, Uncle, ask her, how was the flight? And he said, you know, it was not as bad as I thought it would be. And then he said, but I will tell you one thing. I never put my whole weight down on that plane. <laughs> Some of you didn't get it. <laughs> I never put my whole weight down on that plane. And uh, because he thought if he really sit, sat down on the plane, the plane will crash or go down. And, uh, you know, I thought some of, sometimes we church people are like that. We do not put our whole weight down in the house of God when we come. You know, we just sit like this. And... Uh, as a result, we can miss a lot of things. I'm sure he didn't enjoy the flight, even though he was okay with it. We need to enjoy coming into the house of God. We need to really rejoice in being in his presence. You know, when I think about being in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, there is nothing better than that. Nothing better than that. And often we leave out the best things in life I, I read a story about, uh, about a fisherman who, who caught a fish. And uh, one day as his wife was cleaning and cutting open the fish, he, she found a, a pearl inside that fish. And, and uh, a beautiful pearl. And, 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 and she said, look at it. And she gave it to her husband. And he took it to the local uh, jewelry shop. And, and they looked at it and said, wow, it is so precious. I cannot even imagine how, uh, how much it is worth. And he said, you take it to the city and show it to those people who know more about it. And they might be able to give you uh, the price. So he did. He took it to the city. And, and the famous jewelers looked at this. They were amazed at the beauty and the price of that. And they, they even said, we cannot estimate the value. It's so beautiful. So beautiful. And so they said, you take it to the, to the king and maybe there will be somebody there 
They can evaluate it and sell, tell you how much it is worth. And so he did. He took it to the king and, 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 and the royal court met together and evaluated it. And, and they decided it was really priceless, a beautiful pearl, jewel in their hand. So the king said, you do one thing and, and uh, I will take the pearl and uh, I will let you to have anything in my treasure in return for your pearl. You, you are free to take and I will give you uh, some time to do that. So he gave him uh, like a couple of hours to go through his treasure house and pick whatever he wants to uh, get in, in exchange for that priceless pearl. So he, the doors were open for the treasure house and the man walks in and he couldn't believe his eyes. So many beautiful things. On the one side, there was a beautiful buffet prepared in the, in the king's court and beautiful. And, and, and he couldn't take his eyes off of that. Some people are like that. When they say food, they cannot take their eyes off of that. They want to have some of that. So he saw that. And then he looked on this side. He, he saw all kinds of jewelry stuff on that side. And then on the other side, there was a beautiful room, a royal room with a, a beautiful bed and, and, and pillows and everything. And he oh, laid out. So the man thought for a moment, well, I can have all this. So he decided to go and get a good meal from the buffet. And then when he was full, he wanted to rest for a while. So he goes into the, the, the bedroom of the royal uh, palace and comfortable. So, so he lay down on it and he went to sleep. But when he woke up, he heard the announcer saying, your time is up, you come out right now. Your time is up. He said, what? I didn't get anything for my... Your time is up. Sometimes we treat the things of God like we have all the time in the world to do this. But we need to realize that this time, this moment is the most precious moment in our life. Amen. And we need to make use of that time. Praise God. Do not say that I have tomorrow. Jesus, and, and, and the Bible talks about, you know, do not plan. In fact, James tells us that you say if God wills, I will do it. I will come. I will go. So consider that the moment that you live today is the most precious moment you have on the earth and make use of it wisely. Make use of it the best way you can. And the best way you can use your time is to attend the things of God as much as you can. Amen. Praise God. I hope I made that clear. But King Asa, here is a man who started his, his, uh, king, his reign very good. Even God was impressed with him. But in the end, he turned away from God. So his life is an encouragement for us and also a warning for us. An encouragement and a warning as we look at the life of this, uh, generally speaking, a good king of Judah. Ju king Esau was the third king of Judah. Just the kingdom was established and uh, he becomes the third king of Judah. And, uh, but um, as he went through his life, he, he, he slowly began to move away from God and God said, you have done something foolishly. And we will look at that later on this morning. I, I do not want God to say that uh, we have done something foolishly. Even if we do, we need, to have, we need to repent of that. Repent of that and then come back to God. Praise God. Amen. So um, would you stand with me as we read the scripture together, as, uh, as we revere the word of God? It's a good thing to read the scripture together. Amen. And at that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Esa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God. Now remember those things in the red there. Because you relied on the king of Syria, and did not rely on the Lord your God. Because you done that. This is, you know, relying on God is important to God. 
That's, that's the one message I want to impress upon my life and your life today. God, through his prophet Hanani, said to the king Esa, because you did not rely on me. He's saying, therefore, let's read it, therefore is a host of the king of Syria escaped out of your hand. See, God had bigger plans for Ezra, but he messed that up. And God is saying that if you had followed me, if you have trusted me, you would even have one victory, not only over the army of Israel, but also the army of Syria. Now, he messed that up. See, many times God wants us to bless us in a big way, and we get in the way and mess the things up. And that is a warning from the life of Esau. Now, verse number eight, let's read. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? It's a question. And I, the prophet of God, is asking Esau, now think about Esau. Think about the foolishness you just committed, but you go back and remember the time when the Ethiopians came to attack you and he said, were they not a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Now let's read it. Yet, because you did rely on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. Hallelujah! Because you relied on the Lord. Amen. Amen. So the question this morning is to rely on him or not to rely on him. Whether to rely on God or rely on the arms of flesh. All right. So uh, because you rely on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. Verse number nine. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. I love that verse. Amen. Can we clap our hands and praise God for that verse? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love that verse. For the eyes of the Lord runs to and fro throughout the whole earth. Hallelujah. And I can only see so far. And if there is fog, that is limited, even smaller. But the eyes of the Lord, the Bible says, scans all the world. From east to west, north to south. All over the world, the Lord is looking for. What is he looking for? To, look, to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect or loyal toward him. God is looking. God is looking today for loyal people, faithful people, people whose heart is toward God, so that God can show himself to be strong in their life. Amen. Amen. See, if you are facing battle in your life, and if you, your eyes are upon the Lord, God is saying, I will, I will make myself strong in your life. Hallelujah. You know, God is saying the battle is not yours, the battle is mine. I will do the battle for you. But the condition is that my eyes need to be toward God. When I take that off, I do my own thing. I cannot much, you know, think God is going to be there. Uh, but he says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect or loyal toward him. Now, that, here is the punchline. The, the prophet said, herein you have done foolishly. What was the foolishness of King Esau? Rather than trusting in God, he put his trust in the king of Syria. You know, when we, when we stop trusting in God, it is saying that God, you know, I, you know, I would rather go here than here. And, and, and that displeases God. When I put my trust in God, it, it honors God. It, it, uh, God is, look at that, look at that individual, that, that child of mine. He, he just believes in me. So I have to show myself, what? Strong in his 
life. I have to do that because he has put all my trust in me. I, I cannot let him to be disappointed or ashamed. I got to do something. That's what that scripture is saying. But King Esa done something very foolish because even though he had past experience of the deliverance from God, he forgot it and he turned to human arms, fleshly arms to help him. Therefore, from henceforth, you shall have wars. Oh, God had big plans for Asa. But because of his foolishness, putting his trust in the king of Syria, rather than calling upon God, God says you will have wars in the future. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. So, from the passage of scripture before us, we want to learn a few things. Number one, how God views our confidence or relying upon him. What, is, what does God say about me or you putting our trust in him? Does he see that as an important thing to him? Number two, we want to look at the folly of relying on human help. Now, we all need help from other people. We do. But the idea here is that forgetting God, completely forgetting God and, and then going after the help of others. Number three, we also want to learn about the blessing of relying on God or trusting in God. So those are the th three things we want to learn today and impress upon heart. And also with this goal in mind, we need to avoid the temptation to forget God in our times of need. We need to avoid the temptation to forget God. We, we always rush to something other than God. And, and, and the Bible is teaching us, make God first in our life. Turn to him first. That honors him. Learn to trust in God in all situations of our life. There is no situation in your life and in my life that God is not able to solve. Every situation, God is, his power is enough. To, and we know that, but we do not practice that. That's the problem we have. So those are the things we want to highlight today. How God views our confidence in him. The folly of relying or trusting in human help at the expense of leaving God out. The blessing of relying on God and to avoid the temptation to forget God in our times of need and to learn to trust God in all situations. We see the pleasure of God when we trust in him. The pleasure of God is pleased when you and I put our faith and trust in him. All the great men of the Bible uh, became what they become because of their faith and trust. They put their trust in God. They say, they said, God, as David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. He talk about if that is trust or not, right? That is trust. I'm putting my trust in God. He's my shepherd. And I see the pleasure of God in, in his people trusting in him. So as we enter into this study this morning, King Asa, he trusted in God. His early days were really good. It's like some people receiving Jesus into their life and they are so excited and to be a Christian and, and they know God has done something marvelous in their life. They are joyful and, and they, no one can keep them away from God and, and, and they love the worship of God. They love to learn and read and understand more about God. And, but as years go on, they get used to it and, and then become weak and uh, lukewarm in their relationship God, with God. And, and that is a danger that we need to watch against. And that's why we read the admonition in the Bible saying, uh, you always watch and pray because there is an enemy and that enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may. He is always you know, on the lookout. He is trying. So we want to be on the, wa uh, 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 on the watch. We want to be praying people so that enemy will not you know, catch us unaware. So um, he began his reign uh, in a really, really good way. God was pleased with him because 
in chapter number 2 Chronicles chapter 14 and verse 2 we read he did that which was good in the right, good and right in the eyes of the Lord that's amazing that's a, that's a great statement concerning a king in the old testament because most of the kings were evil and they did what they wanted to do primarily turning away from God after idols and 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 false worship and but this king, when he started his reign, he, he wanted to fear God. He wanted to honor God. He, he wanted to trust in God. And, and the Bible gives us this testimony. He did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I can do certain things good and right in the eyes of the people. Because they can only so much about me, right? But when the Bible says he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, that covers his public life and his private life. That covers his public life. And many people are so good in public, but their private life may be rotten. But when the Bible talks about he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord sees everything. There is nothing hid from the eyes of the Lord. So when the Bible gives that testimony, that means that his private life and his public life was pleasing to the Lord. Amen. Praise God. So he began really good. You know, the, if you read some of those, we can read about in, in Second Chronicles chapter 14 on. You need to read that when you get time and understand what the Bible is talking about. Uh, this king and be encouraged and also warned by this king. Amen. This is what he did. He removed and destroyed all idols and all forms of false worship in the land. Now remember the, 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 the kingdom, uh, the people of Israel were a special people that God separated from the world, but, but they turned away from God. They went after the idols. I cannot... I cannot imagine why would they do that? Having seen the glory of God, having seen the, the provisions of God and the protection of God, how anyone can go after an idol? I, I, it's hard to explain, but they did. So the nation was full of idols and false worship. And, and when King Asa came into his position, he removed and destroyed all idols and forms of worship. In chapter 14, verse 3, we read, For who, he took away the altars of the strange gods and high places, and he broke down images and cut down the groves. In order to serve God, we need to destroy anything that pulls us back. We need to cut away, destroy, smash them, throw them away. Uh, when we were in, in, uh, in Trinidad one time, uh, we went into a house to visit that house, and, uh, um, and, and we were told how there were so many idols in that house. And when they knew Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of their life, when they knew the blood has been applied onto their soul, they took all those idols, destroyed them. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Once they bow down before them, these idols have ears, but they don't hear. They have, they have eyes, but they don't see. They have nose, they don't see. Nothing happens, but they will bow down. But when they found the true God, the real living God, they put them in a bag and threw them away. Amen. Amen. So they, the king destroyed every one of them. Every one of them. And also he took away out of all the cities of Judah, the high places where they have built these places for the false worship and images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. Amen. When we do that pleases the Lord, he gives us quietness. He gives us what? Quietness. quietness. Amen. He gives us rest. That's what he did in the beginning. He put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin. Chapter 15, verse 8. He removed his mother, that is really his grandmother, from being queen because she had made an idol. Now think about that. She removed the queen mother because what? Because she made an idol. 
Jesus said, if you love your father or your mother, if you love your son or your daughter, you are more than me, you are not worthy of me. You know, discipleship is something that costs a lot. When we decide to follow Christ, you know, he's saying that uh, I'm not going to take second place in your life. Right. right? Right. If you want to follow me like we learned in the camp, it is a desire of God that we become like him. Right. See, on, Monday, on Friday we studied from the book of Ephesians that the reason Jesus predestined us to be his people is that we will become holy as he is holy. So there is a plan and a purpose for us to be what he is. And that's why we are in this, in this kingdom. Praise God. So he removed his mother. Sometimes many people refuse to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because of their father. Or because of their mother. Or because of their priest or because of their religion, or because of some other thing. And, and they just cannot break away from it. King Esa, when he began his reign, he saw the sin of his grandmother, and he said, that won't work in my kingdom, because I want to serve God. And God says, no idols. Grandmother, you have all these idols. Either you get them out, or you are going to be out. And what happened? He removed her right. from my friends today. If there is any relationships, anything at all that, that hinders you to have a, 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 a firm relationship with Jesus Christ, we need to remove it. The words of the Apostle Paul in Hebrews, laying aside every sin that so easily beset us. Run the race with patience. That's the call on our life. Praise God. So, and again we read that uh, uh, not only he removed all the idols and the false worship, he did something very positive. In, in chapter 14, verse 4, we read he commanded. Now he is the king, he can command. <laughs> he commanded Judah to seek the Lord of their fathers and to do the law, and the, he commanded, he pro, made a proclamation in the land. Right. We want to go back to the word of God. We want you to obey the word of God. There is one scripture there, just below that, which said that he even put an order out, if anybody in his kingdom will serve any other idol other than the true living God, they will be put to death. They will be put to death. I thought, how would that go in modern churches today? <laughs> if you walk in your own ways, if you do what pleases you, and, and, and some people made a proclamation, I think the churches will become empty, won't it? I don't want that kind of a church. <laughs> I don't want to obey that. But he's the king and he can command. It can be, it can be done. This is, this is what he said. If you follow any other God in my country, in my land, you'll be put to death. Now, we are not going to have such law here, okay? <laughs> and he gathered Judah and Benjamin together. This is, this is the king. You know, he destroyed all the things that hinders God from working, but he did all things that will bring God into their life. He gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them. He gathered them. He said, come together. There is a beauty in when people come together in the worship and the service of God. Praise God. And they offered sacrifices unto the Lord because it was stopped for a while. There was no calling upon God. There was no prophecy. And the land was fighting between people and, and it was very, very terrible. But he is restoring order now. They offered sacrifices and, and they entered into a covenant with God. 
to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and all their soul. I mean, this is real business. They, they did that, you know, because God is working in the land. They can see what God is doing through the King Asa. And they can experience the favor and the blessings of God. And they come, to, they come together and they entered into a covenant, an agreement with God to seek him with all their heart and all their soul. I pray today that when we decide to follow Christ, it will be with all our heart and all our soul. Amen. You know, sometimes we are so wishy-washy, you know, so uncommitted. Um, we just have a, uh, don't have a clear path before us. And all Judah rejoiced. Praise God. You know, this is what happens when people of God comes back to him. There is joy. Amen. There is rejoicing. Our key words for the year is, Lord, revive thy people that they may rejoice in you. This is, this is what will happen when, when God revives us. Rejoicing happens. Here we read an old Judah rejoiced in the reformation, the renewal of their commitment. Uh, um, and I like that last part, with all their desire. They, this is what they desire. They desire God now. Praise God. And as a result, God gave them what? God gave them rest round about. Amen. Amen. You know, sometimes people's hearts are so afraid and, 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 and restless because there is no rest. And I believe that because we are wandering away from God. When we are following God, the Bible says he will keep him in perfect peace whose heart is stayed on thee. Amen. Amen. You believe that verse today? He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, that's what we see here. When the people came together and they made a covenant with God to seek him with all their heart and their soul and, and they made it their desire to know him and follow him, God gave them peace, rest, quietness, roundabout. Amen. Today, if your heart is troubled, you know, maybe we need to examine, are we trusting God enough? Or have we put our faith in God like we should? Praise God. So he, King Asa, removed all the idols, but he restored what was to be restored. The reading of the word of God, the obedience to the word of God, the coming together of the people of God, the offering sacrifices to the people, and their covenant with God that they will seek him only with their all their heart and their mind. Praise God. And the next thing I want to highlight is uh, his, his trust in God. As I said earlier, in the beginning he was really trusting God. Really trusting God. He, he wouldn't go anywhere else. When he has a problem, he will turn to God. Let's what happened here. In chapter 14, verses 9 through 15, we read about the king of Ethiopia coming to fight him. Coming to fight him. And, 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 and there was a million man army from Ethiopia. That's a huge army, isn't it? The Bible says thousand times thousand. I think that is million. Right? Thousand times thousand, million strong army. They came to attack the king Esa and Judah. But they only had some 580,000 soldiers. So much in Judah, so much in Benjamin. 300 in uh, Judah, 280 in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Benjamin. So 580. So it is almost two to one. Not quite, but it is almost two to one. King Esa looked at the army of Ethiopia. And he looked at the army that he had and, and he knew that, oh my goodness, I have just, just, just about half as many people as they have. Plus they had 300 chariots that they could ride. We have none. So it is a big mismatch, isn't it? Yeah. Big mismatch. Amen. Thank you, Bill Rock. At least you agree with me <laughs> once in a while. Praise God. So what happened when, when he saw this huge army coming against him and he looked at his army and he found out he is not a match for the Ethiopians. What did he do? Verse number 11 says, And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, 
it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. God, I have no power. I don't have many. You look at the army of, of the Ethiopian Surah, King, King Surah. He has so many people, I have none, no, 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 not nearly as many. Help us, O Lord our God. If we rest, for we rest on thee. That means we trust in thee. Amen. We trust in thee. Amen. And in thy name we go against the multitude. Praise God. This, this is putting our trust in God. Remember David, here David said uh, you know, to Goliath, I come to you in the name of God. You know, and, and when we say that to the enemy, that statement itself will make him tremble. Tremble. So he said, I come in the name of the Lord, that thou art our God, let no man prevail against thee. So the Lord, who smote the Ethiopian army? Huh? Who Lord? Who, who, who smote? Not King, King Ezra. The Lord. Did. The Lord. The Lord. The Bible says the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah. And the Ethiopians fled. Praise yeah, God. Right. Praise God. This is the result of somebody trusting in God. Yeah. Trusting in God. So Asa, early in his life, put his whole trust in God. He cried out to God when there was a war. Is there a war in your life? We need to cry out to God. So God, I know you can help with a few or with many. I know you can do this, God, and I just trust in you. Our eyes are on you. Praise God. Praise God. And, and, and chapter 16, verse 9, I want to remind you again, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them uh, that, 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 that's perfect toward him. In other words, when God was looking all through the world, to, to find one person who will be loyal to him. He sees who? He sees King Asa on his knees, crying out to him and saying, God, we need your help. It's only you can help us, O oh Lord. And, and, and God so sees this man and said, now here is the man that I've been looking for. I'm going to show myself strong in his life. And the Ethiopians fled. Hallelujah. With your life and in my life, when we put God first and put, search him and give our life to him, he's going to say, he has put his faith, trust in me, and I will show myself strong in his life Amen. or in her life. You trust God and you prove God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We need to move along here. Now the king Asa, he, he trusts, uh, now, the, now he, we are coming to the end end of his reign. For 35 some years, he was doing good. A lot of good things happening in the country. Now, he has another war. He has another war with the, with the king of Israel. Baasha. He comes to fight Israel. And what does he do? Rather than calling upon God, he sought the help of ben Hadad, the king of Syria. What a, what a terrible, tragic mistake. Now, he had experienced God in the past against a stronger enemy than King Baasha. But now he runs to the neighboring king and says, uh, would you help me? And not only that, he takes the, uh, the gold and silver from the, from the treasure house of the temple and he sends it to this heathen king and said, uh, you take this and come and help me. Which he does. Which he does. And it appears that it produced the intended result. The King Baasha stopped the building and he left. And, and, and people who look at the situation would say, wow, he is brilliant. He is brilliant. With his, uh, with his uh, association with the king of Syria, he was able to defeat king of Israel. He is brilliant. It appears that it produced the intended result. But the story doesn't end there. And it came to pass... When Baasha heard it, he left the building of Ramah and let his work cease. And, and he left fighting against uh, uh, King Asa. So and the, the thing is that rather than depending upon God, he depended upon this king of Syria. The Bible says there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of 
death. It looked right. The news commentators would have said that King Esa was a brilliant man. And he had defeated King Baasha because of his uh, association with... It looked good. But the Bible says when you leave God out of your thinking, when you leave God out of your calculation, the way that there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of destruction. Matthew Henry made a great statement. It is foolish... To rely on a broken reed when we have the rock of ages to rely upon. Isn't that true? Wow. Praise God. It is foolish to trust on a broken reed like King Baasha when we have the rock of ages to lean on. Praise God. But, but yet so many times that's what people want to do. That's what they rush to. Praise God. May we learn that lesson today that I would rather lean on the rock of ages than any other support that I may be able to procure. Praise God. Amen. King Esau had lost an opportunity of destroying the host of Syria. God was going to give the Syrians into his hands, but now he lost that opportunity. Amen. Do you trust God with all your heart? <clears throat> The question we need to answer, to rely means to trust, to have confidence in, to have faith in God. God wants us to trust in him. We are his people. The Bible says in Psalm 11, 8 through 9, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Amen. So let us begin to think about where my trust is. Where is our trust? Where is, you know, all the things we see today can be taken away. Everything that we have can be taken away. There is only one thing that cannot be taken away. And that is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the presence of God in our life. So that's where we need to have confidence in. Praise God. Our first priority is to trust in God. Call upon him. Praise God. Praise God. This is how we entered the family of, how did we become a believer? By trusting in his name, right? By believing. So that's the way we need to live it. We, we become a believer by trusting him. Let us live by trusting in him every day of our life. Praise God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. That's the promise of God. That's the promise of God. Praise God. So the folly of relying on human help. Often we are tempted to choose human help rather than relying. Often we panic and forget to pray. Often we panic and forget to pray. In Jeremiah, there is a script, in Isaiah 31, it says, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help, and stay on horses, and trust in chariots, because there are many, there are many who go after Egypt. You see that scripture? There are many people who, who will go after other things other than God. The Bible says, Woe to them. And they are many, and in horsemen, because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel. Oh, they do not look at the Holy One of Israel. That's where we need to have our eyes on. Neither seek the Lord. God said to Asa, herein you have done foolishly, that you relied on a, on a king rather than relying on me. Praise God. Remember, the battle belongs to the Lord. If God is for us, who can be against us? I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the word of God. These are the promises that we have from God's word. So we can say with all our heart, I can put my trust in God. I will, I will believe in his word and do what he says me to do. The blessings of relying in God and the children of Judah prevailed 
because they relied upon the Lord of their fathers. This is coming from the previous battle with the Ethiopians. The Bible says they, the children of Judah prevailed because they trusted in God. Praise God. And then blessed is the man who trusted in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and, and, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not cease when the heat comes. But her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Who? Blessed is the man who trusteth in the Lord. Praise God. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Praise God. Amen. So in, in closing, do you find it easy to trust God? You find it easy? Your first inclination is call on God. Do you find it your first uh, uh, desire is to ask God? Do you find it easy to trust God until adversity uh, uh, strikes? When the, when the clouds, when life clouds over, do you suddenly begin to suspect that you only imagined his care for you? He is completely sovereign. God is. He is infinite in wisdom. And he is perfect in love. Building on these rocks, we can learn to trust in God. Amen. That is from Jerry Bridges in his book, Trusting God. When we know who God is, we can completely trust in him. Totally trusting him. We can learn to trust God even when we don't understand what he is doing. We can. We can. Praise God. Amen. There is a story about some scientists going to a, a remote part of a, of a mountain looking for rare flowers and uh, plants. And, uh, and a group of scientists were exploring remote regions of the Alps in search of a new species of flower. One day they noticed through the binoculars a flower of such rarity and beauty that, that its value to science was incalculable. But it lay in a very deep ravine with cliffs on both sides. And to get to the flower, someone had to be lowered over the cliff on a rope because it was way down. A curious young boy was watching nearby and the scientists told him they would pay him well if he would agree to be lowered over the cliff to retrieve the flower below. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Hmm? A rare flower, but it's hard to reach. Someone has to be lowered on a rope to, to get to that and bring the flower back. So the boy took a one long look down the steep, dizzy depths of, and said, I will be back in a minute. A short time later, he returned, followed by a gray-haired man. Approaching to the scientist, the boy said, I will go over that cliff and get that flower for you if this man holds the rope. He's my dad. Praise God. Hallelujah. He is my dad. He is my, my dad. Friend, you have a big daddy. And he has promised he will hold the rope for you. But we hesitate, don't we? We just say, no, I don't know. It's like the man who fell from a cliff and he, was, he grabbed a, a tree limb and he was hanging and looking down and the bottom was so far away from him, he was so scared. And, uh, and he cried out, somebody please help me. Somebody please help me. And, and he heard a voice, I will help you. I am God, you just let go, I will catch you. He thought for a moment and said, is there anybody out there? Anybody else out there? Our father says, I will hold the rope for you. Would you stand with me? Praise God.
There is an old hymn that many of you may know, Trust and Obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen? Amen. Beautiful, beautiful old hymn. If you know it, sing it with me. Praise God. And don't make me look bad by singing with me, all right? (laughs) 